Radio.com, where you can hear us live as we do the show. This is a jam-packed show. Came together very quickly today, Jared. Um, we had we had an idea that we wanted to talk to somebody about the U.S. men's national team. We've got that person on the line right now waiting for us to get to him. It's Grant Wall from Sports Illustrated. We'll do that in a second. In the second segment, we're going to talk to Sean Francis, who is uh, the Offside Rules and uh, formerly MLS Insider. We've got some interesting uh, MLS culture stuff to talk about with, with Sean. Yeah, the and, finance and culture. Yeah, and then later in the show, David Downs, commissioner of the NASL, will come on and talk about the split season situation. They just announced that for NASL for 2013, that they're going to go to this two-season setup. We'll have to talk uh, uh, to David about that, ask him some pertinent questions. But first, Grant Wall, live from Kingston, on the line. How are you, Grant? I'm good. How are you guys? Uh, we're, we're doing. We're going we're gonna to have to juggle all of these balls here. Let's start uh, with the game on Friday, the U.S. men's national team in Jamaica, a place they've never won, but a place they've never lost either. Um, coming into this game, what are the biggest question marks for you, for the national team? What does Klinsman need to figure out about this team in short order? Well, the big thing in my mind is you're missing uh, probably the best three field players on the U.S. team, potentially from the starting lineup. Landon Donovan and Michael Bradley aren't here at all because they're injured. And Clint Dempsey is a guy who hasn't played a, a professional game in almost three months uh, due to all the stuff that's been going on with his unsettled and now settled club situation. So I don't think if you ask me that Dempsey's going to start this first game, I could see him coming off the bench as an impact sub and maybe try and set him up to start on Tuesday in Columbus. Uh, I guess it's possible he could start, but uh, I could see this game being, you know, the U.S. being sort of tightening things up maybe at the start, um, you know, and I, I tried to come up with a lineup today, and, uh, you know, it's interesting. You could see something like uh, a four-man midfield of Kyle Beckerman, Danny Williams, Jermaine Jones, and Maurice Adu. Ah. Uh, which, uh. <laughs> that kind of response that's a lot of defensive midfielders you know? <laughs> that, that screams you're going for a point doesn't it grant <laughs> and it would scream that you know i think the question then becomes do you potentially put jose torres in there even though i thought he was pretty poor for 45 minutes before getting yanked in mexico uh, do you potentially have five midfielders? Or you know, right now, I'm kind of envisioning two forwards with Hercules Gomez and, and probably Josie Altador, mm -hmm. uh, with potentially Terrence Boyd as an option. Um, it's it's really not the most attack-minded U.S. lineup, no matter who they choose to put out there. You know, and you mentioned Jose Francisco Torres and the absence of, like you said, the three big names. This is potential to be Jose Francisco Torres. If he gets the nod, this is his kind of put up or shut up game, isn't it? Haven't we been saying that for a while, Grant? But, but, yeah. but, but the stage is empty tonight, save for him, or uh, Friday night. In a position where they're like not going to get called in again, necessarily. You know, Klinsman seems to pick guys, and especially if they're young, stick with them. I personally don't think Danny Williams has shown much at all. Yeah. And yet, I think that he's a pretty good bet to start this game, if you could believe it. Wow. Um, you know, maybe you throw in a wild card like Graham Zusi, but uh, he hasn't played uh, in a lot of big games. And, uh, you know, Klinsman was willing to, to start Danny Williams at Italy, which I think showed a lot right there. So um, we'll see. You know, I, I think maybe this is a situation where if the U.S. can keep it tied, um, and then bring on a Dempsey and a Boyd and, and go for a, a game winner late, uh, that might be the way they try and take this. Sounds an awful lot like the Bob Bradley era, but, uh, <laughs> you know, you go on the road in CONCACAF and you, and you, you, you take them as they come. Uh, a lot of talk about the, the American team, obviously, and, and the missing names and, and who's going to start. But um, is it possible that, that this Jamaican team, I mean, uh, are they properly rated? Are we underrating them? Uh, are people properly afraid of them? Uh, how, do we, how do we think of Jamaica coming into this game? I got to admit, it's hard to take, it's hard to be afraid of a team that in its last World Cup qualifier tied Antigua. <laughs> yes. Um, now, granted, they did get a 2-1 win over Guatemala in the, in the qualifying opener, but um, I, I don't think this Jamaica team is a team that the U.S. should lose to no matter where they play, no matter who is in this U.S. lineup. And uh, personally, I think four points out of these two games needs to be 
kind of a minimum goal for the U.S. And the whole theme of the year when you look at the U.S. is winning on the road in countries where you've never won before. Right. And the U.S. has never won a World Cup qualifier in Jamaica. They actually have won a couple of friendlies okay. uh, over the years, but um, they've never won a World Cup qualifier here. And if you can win at Italy and at Mexico, granted they were friendlies, uh, you should be able maybe to win in, in Jamaica, I would think. Grant, uh, you're speaking about uh, talking about Jamaica and the team that they have. When I think of Jamaica, and I think of some of the MLS players they have on their team, uh, Dane Richards, Dare Maddox, I think speed. And if we, if the U.S. ends up putting out a lineup similar to the one that you were talking about just a little bit ago, isn't speed really vulnerable to a midfield like that? Well, I would think that the U.S. would very Bradley style kind of pack things in, right. uh, potentially a little right. bit. And you know, if you're if your center, central defense pairing is going to be Jeff Cameron and Carlos Bocanegra, which I think it has a, a decent chance of being, um, you know, those guys aren't the fastest guys in the world, but, um, you know, I, I could see a compact defense with Beckerman in there, uh, with Jones uh, patrolling around Adu, um, you know, and, and really trying to neutralize speed a little bit because, yes, this is a very fast Jamaica team. Um, you know, maybe we may see more of the defend and counter from the U.S. than we've seen at times under Klinsman. Uh, Marisa Du listed on this roster as a defender, and you mentioned him as part of a possible packing in midfield. Is there any chance? I mean, I, I would think that it'd be Jeff Cameron and Carlos Bocanegra, but is there any chance, possibly based on the speed, that Jurgen Klinsman puts Marisa Du out there at center back? There's certainly a possibility of that, uh, especially that's the position he played in the last game. When you listen to Klinsman talk, and I don't know if you guys listen to his podcast, uh, he does put one out there um, with Alan Hopkins, mm -hmm. and he, he's talked about Adu in terms of versatility, and he talks about Adu being able to play every position from center central defense to defensive midfield to even attacking midfield. He made a point of saying that. Uh, the other day, and no matter how you feel about Adu as an attacking midfielder, <laughs> uh, it's it's something that he, Klinsman doesn't talk about Jeff Cameron in those terms. I have a hard time seeing Cameron playing anything but center central defense for the United States right. under Klinsman. Are we uh, not giving Clarence Goodson enough credit when we talk about Jeff Cameron right now? This is the guy that's gotten us through the last uh, two years at center back with Carlos Bocanegra, and isn't there something to be said there about the relationship those two have made together? Mm -hmm. I think there's a possibility you could see uh, Goodson in place of Cameron uh, in the central defense. I do think Bocanegra is going to get the start if he got called in. He's the captain. Um, and, you know, Goodson has played in some important games. Um, but at the same time, he doesn't have the buzz that Cameron has right now. And that's a buzz that he created by playing so well down in Mexico and by going instantly into the starting lineup at Stoke City, mm -hmm. which may not be the most attractive team in the world, but is actually a pretty decent Premier League team results-wise. Yeah, yeah, the style is what everybody has a beef with, but they, they, they do fairly well in the Premier League. Um, talking about one of those big names missing, and, and this is, comes around every time, um, you know, at this point in, in Landon Donovan's career, partly because of th some things he said in the past, the questions are, are we ready to move on? Should we be moving on? Is, you know, is this a, you know, in a weird way, is this a good thing that Landon Donovan's not part of this team? How do you, what do you make of that? Both Jared and I are on the, uh, of the opinion that no matter, uh, no matter what, if Landon Donovan's healthy, he's a starter, but is this in some weird way, a good thing for the United States to learn how to go win or, you know, get a point out of a qualifier in, uh, in CONCACAF without their, leader so to speak i guess you could spin it that way you know if everyone's being honest you want to have landon donovan healthy and on your team so you can put him out there and have a better chance of winning games um and so if he's not here and he's not then you make the best of it and yes you you can take something out of uh performing well without your best guys i think that's a big part of what they took out of the mexico friendly win last month right uh, but this is also not a friendly. This is, uh, this is all about getting points. And, and to be honest, I don't think Jurgen Klinsmann or anybody on the team cares that much about how they get the points right. here as long as they get those points. 
Now, uh, switching gears just a little bit, uh, Clint Dempsey makes his his big money move to Tottenham. I mean, it's you know, it's it, it's big money for an American, certainly. And part of that is he's got a new contract with Tottenham. Now, you we we saw on Twitter you had tweeted out some information that I guess you know wasn't originating from you; it was from another source about Clint's contract. And then right. Clint, Clint comes back with, "Oh, that's I don't remember the exact wording. It was like, nope, not right." <laughs> this is this is one of those things about Twitter that fascinates me. You know, you're a, a respected journalist sharing some information that you got from a respected journalist, and the the athlete can go ahead and just shoot you down in a second. Yeah, it's it's a funny story and very meta in a way, in the sense that the only reason I read this story in the Miami Herald about Dempsey was because Dempsey himself had <laughs> retweeted it in the first place. Um, and so I read the story. It's by Michelle Kaufman, a respected uh, journalist for the Herald. Uh, and in there was something I had certainly not seen before, which she presented uh, in the story as being pretty straight up cut and dry. $22.2 million, not 22.1, not 22.3, <laughs> uh, over three years. And um, it made me wonder if you know Deuce was insisting on 222 or something. <laughs> nice. um, but it, it turns out that uh, you know Dempsey sees this go out there, and I take it as a sign of respect that Dempsey follows me on Twitter. Sure. Uh, but then he puts it, you know, out there not accurate. Which <laughs> uh, it's on me for for spreading something that uh, I did not report myself. So I take some blame for that. Um, you know, obviously it's the Miami Herald story, but it certainly is a, a, an interesting world in Twitter. <laughs> that we can all have these exchanges now, whether it's, you know, Clint Dempsey and me and, and the writer of the story ended up tweeting and apologizing later on in the day. Um, but I also realized, you know, your credibility is all you've got, right. in a sense, in this business. And so uh, I'm going to work on the quality control standards <laughs> a little bit on on some of the retweets, just because I think that's important, you know. And um you know, it's one thing I always do with when people die on Twitter and yeah, there's a yeah. lot of hoax deaths. Yeah. Um, I make a point on, on those situations never to retweet unless I have independent knowledge or I see a full story like from the New York Times yeah. or the Associated Press. Um, and I may just not retweet as much you know, down the <laughs> road here. But it certainly created an interesting situation and uh, uh, is another example of how Twitter's uh, a pretty fascinating tool. Grant, uh, la on the last show, Jason and I had some fun about the, the, some of the best-selling albums of the 90s, and I'm going to put it to you, Grant Wall. True or false, have you ever owned a Shania Twain, Whitney Houston, Alanis Morissette, Hootie the Blowfish, Garth Brooks, Santana, Backstreet Boys, or Britney Spears CD from the 90s? <laughs> Do I have to be honest? Sure. You have to be honest. I, look, I own the Atlantis Morissette CD. I definitely Okay, have. that's an okay one. That's the only one that's allowed. Yesterday morning, listening to your podcast discussing this, and I'm saying to myself, Shania Twain, Shania Twain, Shania Twain. <laughs> I don't own Shania Twain, but I, I did get it before you guys wow. did. Wow. So you've got that 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 musical knowledge from the night. I, I don't know if I blanked on it. I, I, I should have had Garth Brooks. I, I didn't. All right. Grant Wall from Sports Illustrated down there in Kingston covering the USA against Jamaica on Friday. We'll be back for our, our live coverage on Friday, obviously. Thanks a lot for your time, Grant. We appreciate it. Enjoy yourself. Thanks, guys. I do own Hootie, by the way. <laughs> oh, of course you do. <laughs> I may have. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Bye, Grant. We'll talk to you soon. Aren't, they, aren't they from Virginia, too? Don't you have to own them? No, they're North Carolina. North Carolina, I think. Yeah, yeah I think one of the, actually, one of the guys played soccer for North Carolina, Carolina or something, didn't he? Uh, one of them played what? Soccer? Yeah, that soccer might be true. I think for one of the Carolina schools, it may not be the North Carolina, you know, but I think there's no. some school in North Carolina he played soccer for. No, no, that's no, I don't think so. But I don't know. Can we can we honestly own up to Hootie and the Blowfish and still hold our? Never mind. The best soccer show, North American Soccer Network. We come back. Sean Francis, the outs uh, the offside rules. Don't go anywhere.
Jason Davis, Jared Dubois, back on the best soccer show, North American Soccer Network, NASN.TV, NASNradio.com. On the line with us now, the man behind the offside rules, which is, you know, one of those, like, uh, legacy uh, soccer blogs, American soccer blogs. Been around forever. Everybody knows it. Sean Francis. No, I'm sure he already knows it, but he changed the game with that blog. Oh. That's one of the first pop culture soccer sites. Absolutely. Sean, how are you? I'm all right, man, but I... I, can I say that sound like an old Grand Pooh Bobby y'all y'all introed me with? <laughs> Why? <Like>, come on! <laughs> like, <laughs> that, like, I'm the old Grand Pooh Bobby. No, 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 saying, no, no. Look, it back. Okay, everybody's up, gi- y'all? Y'all doing all right? everybody's giving me stick about the music recently. The music is whole. Look, I- I'll explain the music one day. I can't explain it right now. It's not like whatever. It, I can't get Wait, into. You, it. You're here explaining music to a guy that used to work for MTV. Yeah, I look. I can't mess with Sean on music, and I don't want to go down that. Somebody said, "Have have Sean Francis on and let him choose the music," and I would have done that in a second if it was possible, but it just wasn't possible. We brought Sean on to talk about this uh, this idea. He, he expressed it to me. I think it's excellent. It actually kind of ties in with a Kyle McCarthy piece on Goal dot com that that came out today. We see these signings, Jared. Your your team just signed uh, Wilhelmson. How do you say it? Yeah. <laughs> And uh, Seattle's looking at, uh, at at Good Johnson, or however you say that, and, uh, and and there's this kind of grousing around the MLS community that these guys, you know, they should be making more money than than what these teams can possibly offer under the salary cap. Sean, it's not just about the salary cap and what the money is, is it? It's not, man. It's about what can you give me? Other than money, what can you give me? You know what I mean? And I, I think we're at this point now where we're starting to really see haves and have-nots. I mean, look, for years, you know, going back to the days when big soccer was like the thing, there was always the joke of, you know, there's, there's, there's different rules for New York and L.A., you know. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily the case, but New York and L.A. Have, have things that, you know, quite frankly, other markets don't have, right. you know. Um, when you're talking to sort of these, you know, world-class players, the Terry Henrys, the David Beckhams of the world, and now sort of that next year, the Ryder Johnsons of the world, you know, there are other things to consider other than money if you're at that point in your career where you're going to step, step away from Europe. You know, it's, it's, it's everything from, am I going to be in a big market where I'm going to be a celebrity? You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's great to go to Seattle and you are a part of the pop cultural fabric of that city. When you're in Seattle and you're a MLS player, you're a professional athlete. Right. You know what I mean? All the perks of that, all the groupies, all the good tables at restaurants, bottle service, etc. <laughs> when you are yeah. in... Denver in Colorado, if you're in Dallas, you're not really part of the local pop culture scene. Yeah, you may get invited to some events, but you're not getting recognized in the mall. No, you know what I mean? Certainly not. Yeah, yeah. Say, you know, say what you want. Some of these big guys, that stuff matters. If you, you know, if you're Terry Henry, New York is a big draw for you. You'll take less money to be in New York. If you are Christian Williamson and your wife is a beautiful model, you'll take less money to be in LA where the Weather is beautiful, and your wife can probably get work. Um, Stadiums matter. I've talked to guys over the years where, you know, stadiums matter. They're more apt to move to a club that has their own stadium, or say in the case of a Seattle or Vancouver, they've got a big stadium and it's full. So where's Kansas City's big-name guy then? Kansas City doesn't have all that other stuff. They got the stadium. They got the the sick locker room, but they don't have all of that extra stuff. I mean, you know, how many times can you go out to the – to the, I know the barbecue is great, but how many times can you go out to the barbecue joint and hope to get recognized? I mean, uh, yeah, well, Kansas City is one of the, they've kind of flipped the script, you know what I mean? Bit, like, yeah. you know, not to go off topic, but when you look at last year, for a lot of people, the big story of last year was expansion and the return of Cascadia, you know, all the stuff in, up in the Northwest. But to me, the, the, the renaissance in Kansas City is a much bigger story. And, you know, it doesn't work out perfectly. Look, Otter Johnson passed on them, you mm-hmm. know. Rob Heineman publicly said we made an offer to this guy, you know, and he passed on it to play in Greece, I believe, at the time. Um, you know, it's not going to work out perfectly, but they're one of the teams where, again, now they've got one of the best stadiums in the league. They've got, you know, regular sellouts. They've, they've, they can really, you know, they might not be an obvious choice, but they can definitely make an argument. I mean, look, look at last year when they had Omar Bravo, right? Now, we know that didn't work out, but the fact of the matter is, Omar Bravo, Chivas legend, decided he's coming to MLS, and he didn't even go to Chivas USA. He went to Kansas <laughs> City. You know what I mean? Chivas USA which should have been the first person in the front of that line to lock him up. And, yeah. you know, Kansas City was able to come in and do that. So it's not cut and dry, but there's definitely, you know, 
when you're one of these teams that, you know, you, that you may not have the big stadium, you may not be the big market, you may not have the huge budget, you've got to figure out what you can work with to, to draw people in. I look at Nesta up in Montreal, you know, and Montreal's got three or four other, three or four Italian players. They've got a Nelson Rivas as well, who played in Italy for a long time. They've got an Italian family owning the team, you know. I, I don't know. You know, they're not paying Nesta. That's a lot of money, yeah. but all that stuff factors into him wanting to be there. He sure as hell not going to Colorado. You know what I mean? No offense to Colorado, but what are they doing that can draw him in? Montreal might say, "Hey, yeah, look, we're only going to pay you two fifty, two seventy five, whatever." But you're going to be in this environment with, incidentally, your best friend in the world, Marco Devaio, who you've known since age seventeen, and we're a new club. We've got our own stadium. We're we're actually you know a known quantity in town. We're not like a team that people don't pay attention to in town. So. You kind of got to work with what you have, you know. And they do a good job of it. Chief USA on the other side <laughs> hasn't really done a good job of it because they should be able to say, hey, to an Omar Bravo, you've been in the family for X amount of years. We're really trying to go after this Mexican-American audience and have a Mexican-American flair. Come here to Southern California. Be comfortable. It'll feel like home. And they don't no, do Sean, it. They haven't done Sean, it. Sean, I, I, I made the analogy to Jason when we were in our break before we started the show about MLS kind of approaching kind of NCAA kind of standards when it comes to you can't pay these guys, but you can offer them all sorts of like, like come to Miami and play for us because we got the best strip joints in town. You know, <laughs> isn't it getting kind of to that point where everything else matters almost as much as the money? Yeah, almost, almost. I mean, look, at the end of the day, cash is cash and guys need to make the nut, right? If we're talking about these top level guys, they're, they're already... Henri, who's getting paid six point five million or whatever, right. or if it's Nesta who's making two fifty, they've already made their money when they come exactly. to MLS. You know what exactly. I mean? Guys on that level have they're they're set for life. They really don't have to work. When you get down to that next level, say uh, in Columbus now with um the green Kiguain, who's just absolutely killing it, you know what I mean? Like it's different. It's a it's a different thing. Well, which that's a whole other topic. Like, how do they keep getting guys like Higuain? <laughs> Scalotto in it's this weird thing that I don't know if, if Iguain falls into the same category as Scalotto where it was Scalotto liked the, liked the quiet he liked not being recognized he liked going out with his family having his kids go to school and not being bothered that that's balancing out against what you're talking about where some of these guys with you know some of these guys that enjoy the spotlight that that want the extras that have the the model wives that stuff they don't want they don't want quiet they don't want anonymity but some of these uh, some of these other players will come here and and play in MLS because they can walk down the street and take their dog for a walk and it's no big deal. Is that, is that, how do you, how do we, uh, this is the best of both worlds. Why aren't MLS teams taking advantage of both of these situations? And if you're going to complain about LA and New York having advantages because it's LA and New York, then shouldn't you be leveraging the other advantage to go get your own Iguain, for example? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And maybe that's what Columbus has done with the case of those two Argentine players, you know, RSL, maybe that's what they should be doing. I know their philosophy is a little bit different. Their their philosophy is the team is the star. But, you know, when you talk to those guys, if you've ever been out there to RSL or spending time with around that organization, it's a very much a family organization from, you know, the family of the team uh, as far as, you know, them as coworkers and, and them as, you know, an organization, but down to the players' individual families. Like, all the families hang out together. It is yeah. so family-oriented. The cost of living is, you know, <laughs> it's nothing compared to going to the coast. You know what I mean? If you, if I'm those guys, that's what I play. If I go after someone, say, a couple of years ago when Juan Pablo Angel came to the league, you know, he's got two kids. That was a big thing for him is um, his kids' education. Tim Cahill, who's just come to New York, Tim Cahill is uh, very interesting. I'll give you a little a little gossip here from, from what, I've, what I've heard. You know, when Tim Cahill chose New York, New York were talking to three or four other players I heard they were talking to Kaka, who everybody heard about. Right. They were also talking to Clarence Seedorf. They were allegedly also talking to Yossi Benayoun. Mm. At the same time, Cahill was talking to three or four other clubs, a couple of clubs in the EPL. He was talking to a club in the Middle East. He actually went to China. This is interesting. He and Frank Lampard were flown out to China <laughs> by the club that signed Drogba and uh, Anelka, who are now right. you know, allegedly going broke, that club, whatever. But you know, he had all these crazy offers, and he chose to come here, A, because he thought the organization was good and wanted to play alongside, you know, he knew they were bringing class players like Henri and Nasa, et cetera, but also for his family. He's got kids. He wants them to, you know, go somewhere. He doesn't want to send his kids to school in the Middle East kind of thing. He doesn't want to send his kids to school in China, you know. 
he said he didn't want to play in the EPL anymore for any team other than Everton. So, you know, for some guys, that's that's a big draw, and it, and it works out. And I think those teams that are able to, to figure out that, okay, this is what this guy wants and, and bring him in, they're going to benefit from that. SF, we love the fact you came on the show tonight. I got one question for you before we get you out. In terms of your New York, New Jersey dollar, how would you rather spend it for which French duo on <laughs> – would you use your dollars to go see Latou and Henri or Daft Punk? Which French oh. duo is your French duo oh, of choice? Uh, I'm sorry. I got to – I'm going to drop that in. Go for it. <laughs> I love the BBD drop. Yeah. I was more of a do me baby man, but hey, whatever. Ah, that's a tough one, man. I got to be honest. Right now, I would say Daft Punk because Henri <laughs> has scored, what, two goals since April? Yeah. The two has been pretty unimpressive, I have to say, in New York. I thought that was going to be a masterstroke move. It's not working out. Game. It's not working out mm-hmm. well, for no, whatever man. reason. And now now the question is, you know, does Cooper come back into the team and ah, all that stuff. All that stuff that you Red Bull fans have to worry about as you chase your first trophy. Sorry about that. Oh, yeah. Next next year, I, I, I think you're going to see it. Whether they win or lose at the end of this year, next year, I, I think you're going to see a lot of a lot of change because Cooper... Uh, Latou are both in the last year of their contracts. You know, I don't, I mean, look, I, I personally don't think Cooper is their guy. He's nope. great. He's second in the league in gold, yet somehow he's coming off the bench. Strange. You know what I mean? Like, Very strange. Very yeah, strange. It's, it's weird to All right. So do check out uh, SF's work at uh, theoffsiderules.com. And uh, just, he's around, he's on Twitter now. I mean, not, he built up MLS Insider, and which is still around doing fine. Sean is at the offside rule. So go find him on Twitter. Appreciate the time, Sean. Anytime, anytime. Um, next time, let's talk about something scandalous. All right, let's do that. <laughs> All, right. All right, man. Bye. All right, boys. Be good. All right. Sean Francis, uh, the world famous uh, offside rules, MLS, former MLS insider, as I mentioned. Um, he doesn't listen to the show, Jay. The best. Oh, I, the, sh- SF is too busy listening to find who the next big French techno band is or like got, the band we haven't heard of yet. Because the guy used to work at MTV, okay? He's, got, he's plugged just, in all over the place. Yes, I know. Look, uh, uh, Sean Francis is like the arbiter of, of soccer cool in this country. And, and it's oh, yeah. Part- it's partly about the, the tie-in with the music and everything else, and uh, definitely one of the OGs. It was good to have him on the air. Now, we got a couple of minutes here before we have to take a break so we can get David Downs on the air and talk in ASL. Is there anything? But, I mean, we haven't really given our impressions of this Wilhelmson to L.A., the possible signing of Good Johnson to, to uh, Seattle. They fit into what we were talking about with Sean. The interesting thing for me is the, the, the immediate grousing. How can L.A. fit, fit uh, 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 Wilhelmsen into this team? What does he bring, first of all, Jared? Is it kind of... I mean, it's going to be a natural winger. Um, in L.A.'s been getting by with playing Hector Jimenez, a really young player on the outside. I think that budgetary-wise, that's great that they have a player that could contribute to the starting lineup as a really young player. Uh, but uh, he's also going to be really inconsistent because he's so young. You know, he's not going to always be bringing a, a game, game after game. In Williamson, they're going to have a veteran player that's played for this, what, what 75 some caps, I think, for Sweden. He's played for Bolton, Deportivo La Coruña, Roma. This guy is a veteran player that, and he's still only 32. So he went to he went to Middle East before the Middle, Middle East, East, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, but but obviously, okay, and, and I think that, that that gets back to a lot of this discussion is obviously he went to the Middle East for the cash, okay? He was yeah. he went to the Middle East. He's an international, and, and that's all well and good, but is he going to be on the right level after having gone to the Middle East, coming back? I mean, they, they ran him to the paces. That's fine. The, the, the thing about him that we, hadn't, we never got a chance to address is Bruce Arena telling lies about him Calling him Joe Butler or something? He like just that. got the name wrong. And, and to tell you what, I like. I am that guy. I'm that guy that Googled Joe Butler afterwards just to see if Bruce Arena was full of it or not. I saw your I saw your Corner of the Galaxy partner, Josh Gessman, talking about it on Twitter. Say, oh, he played – this Joe Butler guy played for the Virginia Beach Mariners who don't even exist anymore. They're, they're yeah, defunct since yeah. 2006. No, my thing is – I mean, he's great. Obviously, I like the fact that Bruce is playing games just because it's always fun. Oh, love it. 
But my question is, what is the real Joe Butler feeling right now? <laughs> I, I did a search. The only Joe Butler I came up with with Virginia and, and I think it was Virginia, whatever the name of the team was, and Joe Butler. I came up with a reverend. There's a reverend oh. Joe Butler that at some point played some soccer or something like that. And it was a long time ago. That's that's hilarious. So so Bruce it prevaricates on this signing. They get him in. Seattle's looking at Good Johnson, and that was the question. There was well, to go, to go back to SF's to go back to SF's point about money and how does the LA Galaxy fit this guy under the salary cap? You go all the way back to 2007 with Beckham. Beckham's 250 million dear dollar dear quote unquote, quote unquote is yeah, only 25 million. It's just all the other sponsor incentives brought in, and people forget that. That's what that's kind of the thing that SF's talking about in that first part is that is. your salary is only this much. All well, the extras round it out. He's he's not necessarily talking about uh, sponsorships and that kind of thing, which Beckham's but it's part of it. Everybody. Well, no, uh, there may be a little bit of extra cash, but it's it's really not about the cash. Williamson is in in L.A. because it's L.A. And because have you seen his wife? Because of his wife, as Sean Francis mentioned, there's there's some added perks to living in that town for them as a couple, not necessarily just about him playing soccer and how much money he's making. So the, so everybody who wants to cry foul about L.A. signing this player, blame it on the player. Don't blame it on on L.A. You can't really be a hot. You can't really be a hot woman that's scantily clad clad in the Middle East and make a good living, right? No, I don't think you can. Do, <laughs> I don't think you can do that. Look, <laughs> sorry, that's uh, I. Jay Rodius. It's like like a, there's like a ma- magazine called Burka Bunnies or something like that. Yeah, there is something like that. All right, let's let's take a break real quick because I'm afraid we're gonna miss a phone call, and it's very important that we take this phone call. It's the best best soccer show, North American Soccer Network, NESN TV. Guys, don't go anywhere. Back on the best soccer show, North American Soccer Network, NASN.TV, NASNRadio.com. Now we're ready to talk North American Soccer League with the commissioner of the NASL, David Downs, who's on the line with us now. How are you, David? Uh, I'm doing well tonight. How are you? Gentlemen? Should we call you commissioner? I don't know. Is that proper? The uh, sh- commish, David, whatever. <laughs> commish. See, that's cool. If you're, if you're David, gonna- David Chickless might have an issue with that. Who? <laughs> David Chickless, the guy that was on the commish. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. He might. Well, that's what I'm saying. It's cool. He'd be the commish, just like Chickless was the commish. All right, we're here. To, we're, we're, we've got David on the line to talk about this. Uh, this announcement from the NASL uh, came out yesterday. It was supposed to come out this morning. Maybe we'll talk about that. Uh, split seasons for the North American Soccer League. Something new. Something different. Hasn't been done in American soccer. I'm. I'm aware of it from minor league baseball and that kind of thing. David, can you talk a little bit about the decision making process? What prompted um, the ownership, the the owners of NASL to decide that that this was the way to go. Two seasons, two champions, one soccer bowl. 
Yeah, I mean, it's been a long process, actually. Um, it started, uh, I think, with the Inceptional League, maybe even before I came on board a year ago, April. Um, you know, the owners are always looking to to refine things and uh, and present the best product possible. And uh, over the course of the last two years, we've been kind of quietly analyzing how leagues around the world uh, manage their competitive formats. And and trying to see if there was something we could do to uh, to make ours even better than it than it currently was. Um, kind of like the idea that it's it's new and provocative, but that certainly wasn't the uh, the reason for the for the choice. I think the the reason for the for the choice was trying try and do something that would make our our regular season games a little bit more meaningful. Would give our teams a little bit more uh, predictability. Maybe is the right word for. For the way their seasons unfold, uh, and also do something that would give us a little bit more flexibility to do something fun in the middle of the summer that would dovetail with the uh, the international summer transfer window and and the appearance of uh, availability of international uh, club teams looking for exhibition games. So a lot of things came together, and as you correctly point out, there are some leagues around the world that, that do this already, so it wasn't uh, a completely novel idea. And we, we took a look at uh, you know, all the leagues we could, uh, we could examine and uh, factored in the plus and minuses of their various competitive formats against the geography of our teams, the weather conditions of our teams, what we thought the impact would be on the, the marketing for our teams, and ultimately decided of all the ways we could go, and, and there were many options. There was no single one right option. Uh, that that this was one that uh, was very attractive, and indeed we had a, a unanimous vote a couple of weeks ago to uh, to implement it in 2013 and beyond. I think it's really nice that you guys found a way to do something unique in the uh, the American soccer landscape. Um, one thing that it might be a little bit worrisome is how do you bring the knowledge base of the of the fans that you have of NASL up to the point where they understand something that's kind of novel in American sports, so that they're not kind of lost in the shuffle when the next season starts and it's it's different for them. Well, I, you know, already we play a, a single table league. It's just that at the end of the year we we qualify six teams for the playoffs. So I, I mean, you know, the fact that we'll continue with a six uh, a single table league, I think, makes a lot of sense. And and now it's really just a question of of educating the fans that that winning um, the spring championship means something, and winning the fall championship means something, and it means even more to to be the winner of the of the match between the two. Um, you know, interestingly enough, it, it makes every game during the regular season that much more meaningful. But at the same time, if if a team doesn't come out of the gate well in in, in April and May, um, you know, all is not lost for the year because the chance to wipe the slate the slate clean, make a few adjustments, maybe pick a player or two, implement a new system, and and go at it again uh, in the fall. So I, I think what you know the fans will ultimately see is is that actually it makes it more important to play that that game against the Railhawks in May and uh, and that you know it can be an awful lot of fun if if you uh, you know if, if your team struggles in the first half to know that that you've got a second half to go after it. Now, David, the, uh, the you mentioned it. You you said that you know this makes every game more meaningful, and that the flip side is that if you don't come out well and and you're effectively eliminated from a from winning a championship in one of these seasons. Uh, the the question for me is how do you keep the fans and and the teams engaged if in fact they come out flat or or they fall way behind and it's clear that they're not going to have a chance at, at the spring or the fall uh, title how do you keep the the fans coming back to the stadium in the second half of the first half or the second half of the second half well i i, I think again that with, with the second half when you start clean that's probably better than having a team that's you know hopelessly at the bottom of the pack in in early summer knowing they have to play straight through with that with that handicap so i think that in that case it's pretty uh, it's pretty obvious the advantages I, I think the the trickier issue but one that we actually studied is in a in a shortened season since in effect each season is only half as long as our current season how possible is it mathematically to fall way behind and and the answer is it's it's surprisingly difficult we we only have uh, two full years data to go on but um, 
But what we found in looking at last year and looking at this year um, was was that very few teams are eliminated uh, until there's maybe you know at at, uh, at worst three weeks to go in the season, and then they're only going to have one home game or two home games left. So so actually it it it's not as bad as you might initially think. It's in our league is very very competitive. It's tough to win games on the road in our league. And teams are very bunched up. And, and if you looked at the way our, our, you know, two years have unfolded so far, we would have had four different champions over the course of the, the four half seasons if we were to just split them up mathematically. So I, I think it's, it's going to work fine. Um, but, you know, it is new and we haven't tried it yet. So <laughs> we'll, the proof will be in, in how it unfolds. Uh, just, just a quick addendum to that question, kind of along the same lines. Uh, say a team wins the, the, the spring season. What what incentives are there for them to go and actually you know try to win the fall season? Uh, I don't know that there would be a huge incentive for them to try and win the fall season, but I I know that most teams uh, you know that are good enough to to win a championship are are you know good enough to repeat and and likely to uh, want to stay playing uh, at full speed because they've got a a very important game at the end of that. Um, the beauty of having the spring champion hold, uh, host the game is, of course, they've got now four months to to plan the game, and um, so you know it's, it's going to be a, a heck of a fun match at the end. I suppose one incentive is, to, to, you know, is, is that you'll you will have a an opponent who hasn't won a championship in your <laughs> in your final game. But I'm not too worried about uh, good teams playing well throughout the course of the year. David, in the last year or so, uh, NASL has done a really good job of kind of reconnecting a lot of soccer fans with the all things all things NASL from uh, a few decades past. Obviously, the name of the league, the Cosmos are back. You're bringing back the uh, the term for the soccer bowl. Is there it, <laughs> the soccer bowl? Is no. and while all that reengages me as a soccer fan every time NASL does something like that that I'm kind of familiar with. Is there any danger as being viewed as if you're not looking forward enough and maybe looking to the past too much? Or is it just about keeping the integrity of NASL and kind of the heritage? Well, there's no doubt we've embraced the heritage, and it, it's uh, it's a wonderful heritage. But you know, our league is not the same league that, that existed years ago, and and so you know, in, in certain aspects, we're going to do things that are very very forward thinking, including what we just did, um, and and in other aspects, we're we're thrilled to embrace the heritage. I mean, it really is lovely to, to go around the country and, and have people come up to me and, and say how much the old NASL meant and, and how much fun they had. And I, I mean, literally my first game that I attended as NASL commissioner uh, a, a year ago, April, was a, a Fort Lauderdale Strikers game. And a gentleman came up to me in the, in the parking lot as I was walking around the tailgating section and uh, and proudly whipped a, a 1978 vintage Strikers jersey out of the trunk of his car, complete with gl- grief stains, and, you know, told told me his dad had given it to him when he was six years old. I, you know, those, those things are, are just wonderful to have um, as part of our, the heritage we've embraced, and, and even though technically it's not the same league and it doesn't have, you know, necessarily the same aspirations and, and the same structure, um, the bottom line is it's it's really fun for us to be able to uh, even two years into our modern history have a have a past to look back on and uh, and embrace and obviously with hindsight we can we can certainly pick up on the good things and not not worry about some of the things that went went wrong. Hold on, That's so. a it's a perfect segue for me, David, to get into the question of the cosmos. I mean, that, of of all of the things that are related to NASL that people remember, all of all of the heritage that is big and, and you can put on a a marquee the cosmos are eight and they're joining the nasl can you talk a little bit about uh what they'll bring to nasl as a as a you know second division team de facto and and whether or not there's any concern on your part of the uh, the rest of the owners that that this group and, and the cosmos will be using the nasl as a springboard to something bigger and better all right. Well, let me let me start with the first half of your question, and Sorry I'll work <laughs> I'll work to the second part, and you can remind me if I forget. But uh, I, what the Cosmos bring? I mean, you know, first of all, it's a globally known uh, brand name, um, and so that's absolutely wonderful. We got tremendous amount of publicity with the Cosmos making the decision and the announcement this summer, and that, and and it's fantastic. It's definitely heightened our, rel- our relevance uh, throughout the world, and obviously picking up the 
the New York market as uh, uh, as a market in our league is a is a great uh, thing of having the Cosmos uh, as well. Um, I I would also say that the Cosmos ownership is uh, is very strong and that they're going to. Uh, bring a lot just by their their presence around the the boardroom table, if you will. Um, they're you know they're insightful. They're they're strong marketers, and so we're we're thrilled to do that. And and of course you know finally just the idea that we now have um, you know rivalries that we can add from the old NASL, such as Strikers Cosmos or Rowdies Cosmos. I I foresee the Puerto Rico Islanders and the New York Cosmos being an amazing rivalry because of the uh, the number of, uh, of Puerto Ricans living in New York and the, and the links between those cities. So I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's absolutely terrific. Um, and then the second part of your question, I guess, was, you know, do we worry that, uh, that this will be a, a springboard to, uh, you know, for the conference? Right. A, 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 a temporary kind. agreement, so to yeah. speak. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, think, uh, I think in fairness, uh, we're, we're, we, we couldn't survive as a league if every single one of our teams moved to MLS, you know, in, in a matter of uh, a couple, three years. And then that obviously is not something that would be healthy for us, but we're exceptionally proud when, when one deserving team occasionally does. And, and we love to point to, you know, Montreal's success in MLS and, and uh, the fact that, um, uh, you know, Portland and Vancouver were playing Division Two uh, alongside our teams, just under a different umbrella. Uh, you know, as recently as two, three years ago. Um, so I, I think it, you know, one team here or there, if it's the Cosmos, that that's not the uh, that's not the end of the world for us. And and we're you know we're exceptionally proud when when a team like that moves up. And in the Cosmos specific case, I'd like to think that it, it's it's a possibility and it's clearly our job and our mission right now to make playing in the NASL for them so attractive that they, they won't dream of it. <laughs> they won't be able to afford it. They won't want to move. Uh, they'll be very happy where they are. That, that may or may not be the case. You know, time will tell you that. And, and we obviously have to do a good job of, of continuing to grow the league and, and, and making it stronger day to day, um, in order to achieve that. But, um, but partly by their being in the league, we, We've got a, a already a step in that direction. Quick, quickly, because people will be mad at me if I don't ask. Where are we expanding to next, David? <laughs> well, uh, there's a there's a couple cities that we have agreements with on paper um, that uh, we're going to make announcements on shortly. But our prime focus right now, I think, is on the West Coast. Um, we're we're weak in that area. We want to get out to the West Coast. Or we've had serious discussions with. Uh, Groups, uh, frankly, up and down the West Coast, and in, in Sacramento, and Los Angeles, and San Diego, um, we've had some strong interest in Phoenix. Uh, I know it's not West Coast, but it's out <laughs> west of the Rockies. So, yeah. um, I, I think that's where you know, other, other than these two announcements that I think you're gonna you're gonna see uh, in the next uh, few months at the at the latest. Um, I, I think that'll be our our main focus afterwards. Well, we appreciate the time. Best of luck with the uh, the split season experiment. Hope to uh, hope to see um, you know hope to see success with it. I- I'd like to see something different on- in American soccer like that. Thanks a lot, David. Well, you're welcome. And and I just quickly, I I don't want to call it an experiment. Right? It's, it's oh, okay. Format. Yeah, no, <laughs> cer- certainly. You guys aren't treating it as an experiment. I understand that. Yeah, okay. It, it's the <laughs> way things are going to be in the NASL. It's going to be interesting yeah, to watch okay. in 2013. Thanks a lot, David. Oh. Uh, you're welcome. Nice to talk to you guys. David Downs, Commissioner of the North American Soccer League. And uh, with that, we'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll wrap up this show. Did, maybe Jared and I will get a chance to talk a little bit. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. It's fun. Best soccer show, North American Soccer Network, NASN.TV.
back to close out this episode of the Best Soccer Show, North American Soccer Network, NASN.TV, NASN Radio. People got your money's worth tonight. Less Jason and Jared and more of really impressive guests. <laughs> Some people may say that's an improvement. Yes, people people may say that's an improvement. Uh, currently going on in MLS, I believe New England has a one nothing league on Columbus, which I hear is a very blah game. I, I haven't had a chance to flip over. And uh, Portland and Colorado just kicked off. I'm not sure what's going on in this one yet. Uh, but, Jared, we uh, we do have the phone lines. We normally take calls on Wednesday. Haven't had time tonight. 201-430-2378 is our phone number. If you want to get in, give us your thoughts on on anything discussed tonight. The U.S. Men's National Team, um, uh, the Sean Francis theory, which I think is a very sound theory, or or David Downs in the, the split season NASL uh, plan for 2013. Decision. Technically, technically, we took three calls. Te- technically, we did. Yes. Well, te- yes. Technically, we took. <laughs> I, I, no, I, I love a night like this, to be honest with you. I mean, there's times where you and I can just talk, 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 you know, but every once in a while, I kind of dig having someone on just get someone else's points of view on this. And three great guests. I mean, I don't know if we can get much better than what we had here outside of just getting big name players or anything like that. Uh, our producer Trevor said on Twitter earlier after we lined up the last one, he said it's like an Ocean's Eleven lineup, and I said, "Oh, that makes me that does that does that make me Danny?" And then I was told that because I had to ask if I was Danny, that doesn't make me Danny. Ooh, that's kind of true. But you're definitely Rusty. Well, then I'm Danny. So screw you guys. If I'm if I'm Rusty, I should have worn a better shirt tonight. Uh, d- d- <laughs> Rusty's always impeccably dressed, constantly eating, and always wearing sunglasses. Yes, constantly, uh, constantly well dressed and, and eat. I, you know, until you said something, it hadn't even occurred to me that he's basically eating in every scene of that movie. Oh and yeah, you gotta check it out. He's always licking his fingers. He's finishing some kind of messy sandwich or something. We're, we're obviously talking about the 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 modern version of Ocean's Eleven and not the original the Sinatra version, which I don't think I've ever actually. I may have like caught a glimpse on cable one time. I want to oh, see seen it. it. Is it bad? No, no, it's not bad at all. Okay, yeah, it's, it's, it's guys, it's good. I like the Rat Pack movies. I mean, there's uh. I, I, uh Dang, Robin in the, Robin in his hoods or something like that was another one. There's a few other Rat Pack movies out there that are all, all really good, and Ocean's Eleven's probably the best one out of all of them. Okay, yeah, the, the all of those guys are in it. I mean, I remember the, HBO did a, a a movie about the Rat Pack, and they were out in Vegas filming that. And it, do you remember that movie? I can't. I think Don Cheadle played uh, Sammy Davis Jr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, God, there was Peter Lawford. There was a bunch of different guys. I, I enjoyed most of that movie. I saw that one too. Ray Liotta played Sinatra, I think. That's right. That's absolutely right. All right. The 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 news that came out today, courtesy of our man Brian Sharetta at Yanks Abroad, Yanks Abroad prog- uh, podcast on the North American Soccer Network, is that there may be another dual international interested in playing for the United States, currently playing soccer in uh, the Danish Superliga. His name is Aaron Johansson. Johansson? Aaron Johansson. I'm getting tonight. I'm just being inundated with these uh, Scandinavian, Scandinavian names. Killing me. Killing lots me. Lots of double consonants. Lots of H's yes. and M's. Uh, Johansson is currently leading the Danish Superliga in goal in uh, in goals, and it's like they're not that far in. They're a couple of weeks in, right? Eight. So, yeah. uh, seven goals in eight games, leading the Danish Superliga. Scored three. Was it a hat trick in four minutes? Is hat trick in four minutes. Yeah. And, and here's the thing. I I, I watch it. And I, first of all, I don't want to disrespect some guys got seven goals in eight games and three goals in four minutes but two of those goals i mean he was just in the right place and kind of put them away but, but isn't that still still, isn't that what you want oh, yeah, of course of course right of course place, right time just Ab- absolutely yeah. that 100 and here's the weird thing how does a dude from iceland get born in alabama yeah that was the discussion uh brian let slip that that uh johansson was born in alabama he's 21 years old so that 1990 uh, he was born and I immediately, I lived in Alabama on two separate occasions when I was in fifth grade and when I was a sophomore in high school. So I, you. I think that I was living in Alabama or I was just about to arrive when this kid was born in Alabama. Not that that means anything at all, but it, you so you're have, saying you could be the father. No, no, the you wheels could start, be the father. I was, I was 10. Yeah. The wheels start turning though. Like, uh, what brought this Icelandic family to to Alabama? And I think Brian's going to have that information in his story, which I don't know that it's it's landed on yanksabroad.com yet. So we'll have to wait. So obviously, this guy's looking to have probably have a connection with with the U.S. national team. Uh, Gruden and Klinsman may to take a look at him at some point. And uh, obviously, the U.S. U, the U.S. is always going to have a better chance of qualifying for World Cup than Iceland. So it seems outside of maybe nationalistic right. patriotism to stay with uh, to stay with this team. <laughs> professionally, the, professionally, the U.S 
say he's going to be a much better option for it, him. This is this is this is an Icelandic teal bunberry, perhaps. I mean, I, you know, well, that, and then our then our producer Trevor comes out on Twitter and starts talking about, oh well, Iceland's on a resurgence and has a golden. Who knows that stuff? But Iceland, uh, Iceland, Iceland is the, their problem is they're behind the eight ball playing in UEFA, right? I mean, that's the yeah. bottom line is it's going to be very very difficult for them to get out of UEFA to make a World Cup. Did they? Did they make the the last Euros? No, I mean that 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 kind of thing where you're skipping. You know, may, maybe you have a chance of making a, a big tournament once every decade, as opposed to every single big tournament for the Americans. Now, the World Cup's the only real big tournament the Americans play in, but uh, but that's still you know getting to a World Cup's got to be a big deal. I don't know how, how how this kid feels about America. He could be very Terrence Boyd. All that doesn't make sense because his parents. I don't think either one of his parents are American. He just was. I, see again. I don't know. I don't know the story. Maybe and that's why you got to follow guys like I, Brian Charetta. We got to wait for these details. I'm just always floored when we hear about these guys out of the blue, coming from nowhere, had no idea that they existed. Just you know. But here's the thing: two years ago, maybe two and a half years ago, I think everybody would be clamoring like, "Get this guy in to have him take a look." Now. The depth at striker is a lot better than it was two years ago. I mean, you remember how 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 empty the cupboard was? I mean, to a point where you're wondering if Eddie Johnson at Cardiff is a good option, you know, right. for, for U.S. men's national team. And now you have some pretty legit striker options and depth at the U.S. national team. Yes, no, I I agree with you. I mean, a part of that is is Terrence Boyd, the the his emergence as as a real threat, and now that he's playing fully, you know, as a full professional in a top league. I mean, a top flight league. Excuse me. Um, and getting games and scoring goals, it kind of reinforces the idea that he's he's one for the future. Josie Outdoors finding himself, found himself, and say it past tense now in Holland, so that's that's working out. Hercules Gomez still scoring goals. Uh, even the MLS options, Chris Wondolowski, Kenny Cooper, if you wanted to go down that far, Alan and, Gordon, and Alan Gordon, and then there <laughs> you know there are even younger players in MLS that show promise that we were excited about a while ago and kind of put on the back burner because we had the Boyds. And the Altidores, but uh, CJ Sapong and and not Teal Bunbury now he's hurt and and kind of took a dip, but those guys were still guys we were looking at. Oh, this is the future of our striker pool. Maybe it's not. Maybe the future of our striker pool is Aaron Johansson, who plays in Denmark and was born in Alabama. I I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's a brave a, new U.S. men's national team world, it man. Is. It really is. All right, lads. This is what you do. You go to iTunes and you sign up for our feed, our our stream, you whatever. You subscribe. That's what the word is, right? You subscribe. You rate and review us. Uh, those help. Us a lot uh, in the iTunes rankings and the like. We um, are on Twitter, Best Soccer Show, Facebook.com slash Best Soccer Show. We're getting ready. It's a slow process, but it's coming to relaunch uh, to relaunching bestsoccershow.com, which we're going to kind of make into a, a full service American soccer blog slash website. Jared, what am I missing? Is there any detail this I need to for the Friday, people? Are? This Friday on the 7th, full coverage of the U.S. men's national team woke up qualifier against Jamaica, including pregame, halftime, and postgame analysis by yours truly and my boy, JD. <laughs> yes. We were here, we were here analyzing things. And, and, and maybe just talking about the rat pack. Yes, we could do that. Or we'll talk about uh, albums from the 90s that, that nobody I'm ever- sure there'll be at least one cool runnings reference. <laughs> because of Jamaica, yeah, those are our, <laughs> our cultural touchstones when it comes to Jamaica. <laughs> Bob Marley, uh, Cool Runnings. Uh, what else? What is a belly? Is I, I when we were talking? Yeah, about? Uh, what, what's the how Stella got her groove back? <laughs> I haven't seen that one. So that one's you all. You seen how Stella got her groove back? No, I have not. We are on Stitcher. We are on TuneIn for NASN Radio. Make sure you check out NASN Radio. I should be proud it of that. I should not legit. be proud of it. It, yeah, don't be proud of it. I, I said I owned Atlantis Morissette, and I'm getting crap for that. You saw how, how Stella got her group back. St- Stitcher, tune in, uh, nasnradio.com, Winamp, Real Player, all of those excellent ways to check us out and all of the excellent shows. We just added Seeing Red NY. Seeing Red boy, Mark Fishkin, oh, who's, been, who's been on the show. All of those guys over there. So uh, check it out. You will not be disappointed. I think that's going to do it, do it for us. Thank you to Grant Wall. Thank you to Sean Francis. Thank you to David Downs. We will talk to you guys on Friday, game time, game night. Yeah.